Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's video, we'll be asking the question, why did men stop wearing dress watches? Now, if you're a regular viewer, you'll be used to this series and understand the concept, but if you're new, it's pretty simple. We take items that are synonymous with classic menswear, and we look at why they've fallen out of favor as of late. For example, you can see our thoughts on hats, waistcoats, and dress shoes in these videos here. So today, we'll be looking at dress watches, or at least looking for them, and trying to figure out why they aren't on more wrists. First though, we need to clarify what we mean by a dress watch. Now, I'm not sure about you, but there's been quite a bit of confusion over recent years about what a dress watch actually is. This is clearly written by an Englishman when the script says whilst. <laughs> whilst there are likely multiple factors. Now, while there are many factors, one to begin with is the way that products and watches in particular are categorized and listed on e-commerce sites, eBay and Amazon being two of the big players. So this image is a perfect example. In order to be seen in as many categories as possible, if you read it, it's confusing and doesn't really make sense. A military watch, a casual watch, a dress watch, a leather band watch, this poor watch has an identity crisis. For those of you in the know, you can probably tell what kind of watch this is, and by looking at it, it's not a dress watch. And I wouldn't buy this. Being new to watches and wanting to buy your first dress watch, this description could lead you to buy something that you believe is a dressy piece, which really isn't. So let's set something straight and define what a dress watch actually is once and for all. First, a dress watch will have a moderate size. Unlike sports watches where it's important to have a good size to know the time when you're diving or racing, moderate size is key. You don't wanna look like you have a hockey puck strapped to your wrist. Second, a dress watch will have an elegant design and simple features, usually the hour, minutes, maybe a running seconds, maybe a small seconds, maybe a small date window, but overall I wouldn't choose my Omega Speedmaster as a dress watch because the dial is too complicated. Third, a dress watch will have quality materials at the very least, stainless steel, but it really should be in a precious metal. So plastic, rubber, carbon really is a no-go. And lastly is timeless styling. You want to watch that'll look good with every piece of your outfit that you can buy now and dress up 40 years from now, and it still looks like it's in the right place. Also, while there might be watches out there that technically meet this definition, we're going to be steering clear of the mass market interpretation and fashion watches as a whole. Now, I know that this might be controversial, but the reason why we're avoiding brands like Daniel Wellington is there really is no true heritage and there isn't that dedication to quality, craftsmanship, and really nice materials that we here at the Gentleman's Gazette stand for. So now that we have a clear definition of what we're looking for, let's turn back our watches and go look at the history of when men actually started to wear them. And actually, fun fact here, men were not the first ones to wear dress watches. I thought it was Ly Leicester, Leicester, I don't know. History tells us that in 1571, England's Elizabeth I received a wristwatch called an armed watch as a gift. A wristwatch was created for the French Empress Josephine de Beau, goodness gracious, Jack. Josephine de Beauharnais is how it is said it. What the f Josephine. De Bourne. De Bourne. Okay. Josephine de Bourne. In 1806, a wristwatch was created for French Empress Josephine de Bourne. God, there's another one. <laughs> Joseph Countess Koskowitz? Nope, don't need to pronounce it in, in Italian. No, I don't need to pronounce it in Hungarian. And in 1868, Patek Philippe created the first Swiss wristwatch for Countess Koskowitz of Hungary. Now, men at this time continued to carry pocket watches as they deemed the small, delicate wristwatches for ladies. That was up until the dawn of the 20th century and the events of the First World War. Although some men had started to adopt wristwatches in the 1880s, the functional needs of the trench watch in World War I started to put practicality among stereotypes and assumptions, and men started to adopt them. This world event on a huge scale would forever shift the viewpoint 
of wristwatches as men started to take practicality over prejudice. From that point forward, the pocket watch began to be widely replaced by the trench watch. Now, these trench watches were effectively pocket watches that were repurposed for the wrist. The lugs were soldered onto the case, as you can see on this Lancet wristwatch from Pulp Fiction. Another element of the trench watch was this sort of grill or protective cover over the dial of the watch, which, as you can tell, really impacted legibility. And although these trench watches might seem like a rude interpretation of what a wristwatch is today, as we know throughout classic men's style, that military heritage gives a masculine signal and masculine status, and men adopted it. From there on out, the wristwatch was here to stay. Following the war, the popularity of the wristwatch soared, and it seemed like every watchmaker wanted to get in on the action. Rolex has been a name within the watchmaking world for decades, and we can see here in the 20s when they took the rough utilitarian trench watch and started to add some style elements to let it be worn every day. The 1930s saw an increase in active lifestyle and saw JLC release their Reverso collection, which could be worn effortlessly in formal and in sporting occasions. Towards the end of the 30s and end of the 40s, wristwatches were still popular, but the Second World War demanded that these pieces were used by military units and sales for the public dropped. However, the market recovered, wristwatches were still desirable, and in 1948, Omega released their famous Seamaster line. Towards the 50s and into the 60s, wristwatches started to take a more simple and sleek look. Slim and smaller watches were favored and where numbered dials were pared down to baton and dagger hour markers. We can see that on this Movado from the 50s, and this IWC from the 60s. Now, it's at this point in history when men started to wear dress watches less. Now, yes, we could totally just say that this is when things just became more casual, but that's not why you're here, right? Now, we've spoken about the overall casualization of menswear and the decline in quality, so if you wanna check out those videos, check them out here. But let's dive in and look at some reasons why men stopped wearing dress watches. First up, and probably one of the biggest contenders, is the rise of sports watches. Now, while it's certainly not the first sports watch in the world, there's no denying the iconic popularity of the Rolex Submariner. Sean Connery's debut as super spy, James Bond, saw him wearing the Rolex Submariner with a variety of outfits, including formal wear, which is a trend that all the current Bonds still follow. The author of the Bond books, Ian Fleming, would often take items that mattered a lot to him personally and apply them to his characters. So literary Bond wore a Rolex Explorer, but in the movies, he had a Submariner. A great example of Bond wearing the Submariner with formal attire is in the movie Goldfinger, where he wears it with a warm weather black tie ensemble. Now, although the Bond franchise would feature other watches on Bond's wrist, they were almost always in the sports watch style. They were on metal bracelets, had high contrast dials, and rotating dive bezels. Overall, iconic characters, whether they're real or not, have a massive influence on what's popular in men's style. Especially when characters such as Bond, who are very masculine, wear a sports watch with formal attire, that trend catches on. The only problem is, not everyone can afford an expensive sports watch, which is great news for manufacturers of watches with cheaper materials. Indeed, wristwatches were no stranger to the uptick and usage of plastics and other materials in the 70s and 80s, and it's something we haven't seen the end of yet. And even if it's not plastic, there's metal alloys and other unusual materials such as rubber or even wood. These materials are a lot less expensive than the traditional precious metals used in watchmaking. Of course, precious metals cost a lot of money, and the average person might not want to spend thousands of dollars on just one watch. Indeed, this is where we see a change in our society as we want cheaper items and more variety rather than investing in one high quality piece. Typically, back in the day, people dressed up, so a dress watch was the one watch that a man owned. He had it for his whole life, as well as a few other nice jewelry pieces such as cufflinks or signet rings. I know a lot of you can think about your grandpa. He might have had one watch that you remember him always wearing. I know mine did. He had a long jeans that he wore from the time that he was married up until the time that he passed. Overall, all these purchases would have been intended to be a high quality investment that would last a long time, could be passed down to the next generation, and the owner didn't have to worry and fuss about buying a new one. They could buy one and wear it reliably. Of course, no one's planning on wearing a $20 plastic watch for 40 years, but that's the point. People want to have more and to change up the color and the style. Individuals today also want a lot of variety because they see celebrities have a lot of watches and fashion pieces, and they want that too. But let's be honest, we can't all afford the watch collection of Dr. Strange. 
As a quick aside here, quality watches don't always have to have a mechanical movement. Many use quartz. Iconic watches such as the Cartier Tank and JLC Reverso have quartz movements inside of them to offer the same high quality watch and look for a lesser price when it comes to the movement. And battery powered movements moves us right into our next topic about the decline of the dress watch, which is digital watches. Now, we've taken a deep dive into digital watches and asked the question if they're timeless or a trend, but overall, they don't add the same amount of elegance as a classic dress watch. In the 1980s, the digital watch started to take the place of the everyman's watch. Although the first solid gold models, like the solid gold Pulsar, were thousands of dollars, they very quickly reduced into the $10 to $50 range. This dramatic decrease in watch prices was because of, well, you guessed it, cheaper materials. This meant that rather than saving up your money for that one piece that would last you the rest of your life, pretty much everyone could quickly save up and own a watch. The huge benefit in owning a digital watch was the fact that they were battery operated, which was a lot cheaper to produce and to maintain. A battery exchange would cost a couple bucks. You wouldn't have to wind it up or to maintain a service on it like you would for a manual wind or an automatic watch. Even today, a digital watch is going to be about 100 to 200 times cheaper than a fine dress watch, as evidenced by some of the Casio digital watches, which have that funky retro design. But in the 21st century, a digital watch might even feel like old tech to some, and in the age of the internet, innovation is key. Starting with smartphones in the late 2010s, people have been relying on smart technology to do a variety of things, including tell the time. In fact, I think this scene from 2013's The Internship sums it up pretty well. Nobody wears a watch anymore, they just check their damn phone. Maureen, what time is it? 10.26. And while some people still whip their phones out to tell you what time it is, 2015 brought around the Apple Watch. While the idea of wearable technology isn't a new one, we now live in an age where really everything is possible right from your wrist. The biggest problem, smartwatches are just not elegant. Neon straps in rubber colors, bold, bright screens. I don't know what time I just said neon straps in rubber colors. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Rubber straps in bright neon colors and obtrusive screens really don't line up with the criteria that we gave at the beginning of the video for our classic dress watch. And now that I think about it, smart watches could also be a part of our penultimate point, which is supersized watches. Let's just be clear, please don't wear these. Finally, that leads us into our last point, which is a status symbol watch. While this could be in reference to a solid gold Rolex or some other brand with cachet, the reality is this is a timepiece that's worn for all the wrong reasons. The issue with the status symbol watch is that it inspires cheaper made models and fakes to be made like this one we found on eBay. So what this means is that owning something that's tacky or a fake becomes more appealing to the broader audience because they want to show off how much wealth they think they have. But apart from being a flashy statement, a cheaply made status watch really isn't going to give you the same feeling as owning a really nice high quality one. Overall, this results in a disappointing experience. And people who know watches will know that you're wearing a fake, which doesn't send the best message about you. So where does all this leave the classic dress watch? Are all the reasons that we talked about going to mean the end of the dress watch for men? Well, I certainly don't think so. In fact, over the last couple of years, there's been a rapid increase in interest in the vintage watch market. And that means that all those gorgeous dress watches of yesteryear are now an attractive prospect again. And the best part is many of them can be quite affordable. For the price of many modern watches, you can find a selection of really nice vintage watches, which check the box of timeless style, elegance, and quality. Also in the current market that's dominated by sports watches, take a look at some really famous brands and look at their dress collection. There are quite a number of models that are undervalued. As always, we would love to hear your opinion on dress watches in the comments below. Do you own one? What would you like to buy? What brands do you like? Please let us know. In today's outfit, I'm wearing a fall winter ensemble. I have a brown check Caruso jacket, a pair of suit supply gray flannel pants, and a denim shirt that was made to measure for me by Beckett and Rob. On my feet are my Allen Edmonds Atchison model tassel loafers in a brown color. My socks are our Fort Belvedere two-tone socks in gray. And I'm wearing our white linen pocket square with a hand rolled X stitch in a navy color, which picks up the blue of my jacket and of my shirt. On my wrist is my Omega Speedmaster, which as you know, is my daily driver. I don't own a dress watch currently, but if I did, it'd be one of the models that Federico at Delray Watch sent us over, including a yellow gold Cartier Santos, a JLC Master Ultra Thin with this really nice gold dial, or this rose gold Montblanc. This video is 100% not sponsored, but we want to say thanks for them sending these over. 